Hello, everyone. I'm super happy to be here and super glad that you can join us for this conversation on video games. RightsCon is, uh, uh, is having its 10 year anniversary. And it's fantastic that last year we had this conversation on video games and human rights. And for this year, we have two dedicated sessions on video games and this fantastic fireside chat with these two amazing people that I have here. Mace Longboat and Kishona Gray. I'm going to present them. Uh, I'm, let's, let's go here. Uh, let's go. Sorry, I'm super nervous because I admire you so much and I'm like super nervous about this. Uh, let's go first with Kishona. I'm hoping not being butchering your name. Uh, Kishona is author of several books. Her latest book is Intersectional Tech, Black User in Digital Gaming. And she's currently an assistant professor in communication, gender and women's studies as well as an affiliate in Black Studies and the University of Illinois in Chicago. She also served as a visiting assistant professor at the MIT in Comparative Media Studies and the Women and Gender Studies program. Her research is influenced by her this interdisciplinary training and grounded in critical race theory and feminist approaches to knowledge production. production. And also we have here Mace. Mace is an award-winning uh, creative producer of the game Terra Nova. I, it's, uh, Terra Nova is a two-player cooperative platform created by an indigenous-led team based in Montreal. And the game explores uh, the first, how would the first contact look between indigenous and settlers pe settled people uh, in a future 10,000 years from now. The game won Best Emerging Digital Interactive Work and the Imaginative Film and Media Festival in 2019. And it's available in, in, at etio.com. Um, I'm super happy, super happy to have you both here. I'm super glad to have this conversation. And to break the ice and also my nerves, uh, I would ask you this first question. What is your favorite game and what got you into gaming? Whatever you want to start. Oh my goodness, that's the hardest question. You're going to start with the hardest question first. Um, so first off, thank you for for. Uh, allowing me to share space with you all. Um, my favorite game, I think I'm a huge fan of the Hitman series. Um, I think that was like one of the games that I love playing, even though it's not like sandbox or open world. I love the worlds that you can kind of like roam and navigate. But I also love, you know, the AI, you know, like the, the, the awareness of like the AI, you know, so like if you run too fast, you know, they're like, what are you doing running? Like it was, I think it was one of the first games where I saw such advanced AI. Um, so I would say Hitman is probably um, my favorite game, but I'm gonna say, what am I playing right now? Apex Legends is the game that I'm just playing right nice. now. Nice. And what about you, Mace? Hi, yeah. Um, yeah, thank you so much for that warm introduction. I'm super happy to be here with you both. Um, yeah. Uh, in terms of my favorite game, I think I got to go with like the first game I fell in love with, and that was Pokemon Blue. Um, I mean, I played it as like a very, very young child, and I think it was the first time I kind of was able to immerse myself and kind of project my personality and my desires onto into a world, into a virtual world. So I'm gonna have to go with that one. And it's also fun to just like battle pets <laughs> and grow your team and, and grow your bond through, uh, through teamwork. I love that because talking about growing bonds and that's one of the things I love about gaming is that how they allow us to create bonds and to find our communities. Uh, I, I love how Kishana presents herself as a professor, uh, as a gamer posing as professor. And that uh, led me to something I wanted to ask to you. How did gaming impact on your research and work? How, how that this kind of gaming growing up, this culture of arcade and, and console gaming led you to, to the, your work and research? Ah, oh, that's a beautiful question. Um, I love, you know, with that bio, you know, what what um what what Michaela's referencing is my Twitter bio where I say I'm a gamer posing as a professor. Um, because I think, you know, it's one of the biggest finesses and one of the biggest flexes that I feel like I've been able to do, like to figure out how to turn my love and passion of video games into like a career and a job. You know, like I get paid to play video games and study them and research them. You know, like so I mean, I don't know. That's like the biggest flex on earth and so I'm excited that I get to do that um but I think um uh 
you know, I, you know, I'm a lifelong gamer, right? You know, and I think how I, I didn't realize that I could do gaming in this way, right? You know, I didn't know the different pathways. Um, I didn't know what the opportunities were. I didn't know what kind of access I had to me. I didn't know what the resources were, you know, so I'm thinking about, you know, how I like to like leverage my privileges and leverage my resources for other folks who are coming up, especially, you know, like black and indigenous women, you know, trans communities and queer communities to let them know like, okay, this isn't just a space, you know, for cis heterosexual white Western, you know, people, men in particular, right? You know, I want them to know that that th these are spaces where they, they are valuable, they're valued, they're needed, despite what the system or the structure say. I'm like, you know, games needs us, right? Um, but I didn't really know how to like leverage that, right? And so I kind of like started, you know, like kind of small and incrementally and I started thinking, okay, well, what is it that I could do? You know, what's my slice of like the gaming world, right? I'm not, I'm not industry, I'm not corporate. Um, I've only started recently, you know, getting like access to like those kinds of spaces. But I'm like, you know, one thing that I could do is just equip folks to understand the realities of what their experiences are gonna be. Like if they're streaming or, you know, they're trying to become like a content creator. I'm like, okay, or you're going in there, this is what the world's gonna be. Or people who wanna be like designers and developers. I'm like, okay, well, these are like the prior experiences. You're gonna, you know, experience probably like a lot of isms and a lot of, you know, a culture and a climate of, you know, that folks who are like actively probably trying to push you out. Um, you know, you're going to, there's a lot of precariousness. You know, I'm thinking about like the labor issues and, um, you know, just how like, you know, workers are not caring for like in the industry in a lot of like places. So I, I feel like, you know, I've just tried to like equip folks with like the, the tools that they need so they can be aware, not necessarily, I don't even want to use the word like be like successful, right? You know, because successful that like people, you know, they, they measure that in different ways, right? You know, so I don't, so I want just people just to be like aware of what it means to be in a marginalized and minoritized body in an industry that's dominated by so many like privileged folks, right? And so I think that's where, you know, I wanted to, that's why I study what I do, I study like online communities. I'm like, what's our experiences when we're inside those spaces? And that's just been able, I've just expanded that, you know, in different kinds of ways. So yeah, that's me. That's amazing. Uh, I was thinking through your answer about representation in games, because one of the persistent myths about gaming culture is that ga gaming is from for males, for teenagers. And it's something that we have to fight over all the time. Uh, I represent Women in Games Argentina. That's a community that is trying to create a more diverse space uh, that includes developers, artists, uh, PR people, marketing people, all the people working through the chain value of the, of the industry. And one of these persistent myths is like um, that first games are focused into, to men and are marketed to men. Uh, I have an example, like one of my, probably my favorite game in the whole universe that is Mass Effect. Um, it has three editions and only the last one, you can play last, last, as a male shepherd or as a female shepherd, but only in the last uh, game, the marketing materials had included the female version of, of the, the character. That is also kind of the canonical version. And that's a, a huge, uh, overlook on that um, and something that I want to come to this point about representation that having female characters and diverse characters is not the same that representation because sometimes are being included like a filler app and that that takes me to Mace to ask him about his game that has a very particular take about including new narratives and new characters. Sorry about that. Um, yeah, definitely. Um, I mean, I definitely identify with a lot of what Kishana was saying about leveraging just being a gamer and turning it into something more um, because it is part of my identity. And as I said, like, you know, I've been playing games pretty much since as long as I can remember. So I've definitely grown up in this world where games are just part of the popular culture and, you know, they just really interested me. So um, yeah, I definitely carried that into my studies um, first at the University of British Columbia doing my, my bachelor's in um, First Nations and Indigenous Studies. Um, and during that degree, like being introduced to all of the ways in which Indigenous people are, are using digital media and games specifically to share cultural experiences or not, you know, just be Indigenous creators in this space. 
Um, and that was really inspirational for me, specifically looking at games and saying, wow, like there are people like me who look like me, who come from um, communities like me and my family, um, you know, telling, presenting their, their full selves and their full stories. Um, so that was super inspiring. And it, it, it really made me want to pursue this as uh, an academic pursuit and understand what it means to make games from an indigenous perspective. And so that led me to uh, Montreal, um, where I am currently residing, and uh, do my master's in uh, media studies, but with a research creation focus. So um, through that pathway, I created this game um, as part of my research project called Terra Nova. Um, and it, it, it explores, as Michaela um, mentioned in the intro, what first contact would look like between indigenous and settler peoples if it was thousands and thousands of years into the future. Um, and some really interesting things kind of emerged for me through that process because once I kind of finished it, I realized that like, it's almost like a representation of me as a person. My dad's Mohawk um, and I have family from Six Nations who reside in Six Nations of the Grand River in Southwestern Ontario here in Canada. And then also, um, you know, my mom was born in Montreal and her father's uh, family is Finnish and her mother's family is French Canadian. So it's very like I come from a very mixed, mixed background, and and I have these I kind of carry both of these perspectives with me wherever I go and what I, with whatever I do, and so I saw that kind of totally reflected in the narrative of Terra Nova. You know, it's a two-player cooperative game. One player plays as Terra, this indigenous coded character who lives on a future Earth, and then Nova, this kind of settler alien coded character who lives in the spaceship and is is traveling through space um, with his community to try and like find a new home. So um, that's kind of how I was brought into this conversation, you know, as the developer of this game. And uh, yeah, hopefully that answers the question. I kind of lost it along the way, but. <laughs> no, 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 it's okay. And also sparked me another thing that uh, while playing Terra Nova, one of the things I noticed is that the relationship created between these two characters that are the settler and, and the colonizer are, cooperation relationships and that's very different because always these kind of narratives are framed in a confrontational way so one of the things that called to my attention of the game is like you are trying to create uh, a new narrative about how the, the complexities of how colonial processes work it's not just black and white it's just not something that is very confrontational it's just layers and layers of, of meaning about that yeah, absolutely. I intentionally made Terra Nova's narrative to be super complicated. Like, I think in a lot of colonial nations lore, we have these moments where, you know, the colonial society emerges just out of this moment of first contact, like Chris Columbus lands in, you know, the Caribbean and he meets the people there and he's like, all right, like this is America now. And then we know what comes after that. And it's not necessarily super um, good for indigenous people. Um, but it's really complex, like some, but then you have moments where maybe it is good and it's, it's again, it's just complicated and it's not black and white. But then we look into our media too, and even sci-fi, and we see this very much, you know, alien versus human locked in combat. It's always, you know, either humans going out and colonizing another world um, and interacting with alien species or, you know, aliens coming here and, and war the world style trying to take us over. So. Terra Nova wanted to speak out against that. It wanted to show the moment instead of what came after and really ask players to reflect on what are the, all the different possible scenarios that could come out of this moment. Does it have to be colonialism as we understand it and you know, settler domination and um, indigenous people is kind of like falling by the wayside. Um, I mean, yes, that is kind of like our history, but also no, because there are, you know, I, I believe at least as we move into the future, we have these types of critical conversations about what it means to be, you know, indigenous and what it means to be settler that we can come up with, you know, new speculative future scenarios um, and build something more positive and equitable for everybody. I can think that we are amongst nerds here, so I'm going to quote something for Star Trek. Uh, I don't know if you are into Star Trek and but one of the things on Deep Space Nine is like that. It's like showing the complexities that you have like this tension between hate and love and 
all kind of relationships that you uh, establish with your colonizers. And speaking about dominance, that is a predominant theme because we have like in video games, it's like this heroic culture and this hyper hyper masculinity culture. And this is a question for both of you. How do you find yourself represented in games? When is the first time that you find yourself in a game and did something click on you or like saying, this is me, uh, this is my community? What about you, Kishana? Um, there's there's so much happening. There's so much that I even wanted to like say, like, you know, respond to like with, with Maze. Um, is it possible for me to do that? Like, I don't want, I'm gonna answer that question, but- Yeah, is no, it, no, I, it's okay. Okay. It's, go, go whatever you want. Maze, I often get like the question that people, uh, people say that like gaming will catch up related to like diversity, equity, and inclusion and representations. Like we just have to, we have to give them time, right? And I often, um, so, so for instance, like I feel like that if you hadn't come along with your powerful narrative and your powerful game, the gaming industry would never have done that. You know, they, they tend to think, you know, that, that they, um, they, they just have to, you know, equip themselves with like the knowledge and then they'll eventually like reach that point. And to me, that sounds aspirational. Um, but it also sounds like it sounds foolhardy. It sounds like, you know, I, I, does, does it make sense what I'm saying? Like, so if we don't push them, do you think the industry will eventually reach the point where they're creating these beautiful, complex like narratives like you, like you did, like in Terra Nova? What do you think about that? Well, that's those are very nice words. Um, I think that it's a really tough question. Um, and definitely one that we're talking about a lot these days within the industry, but also in academic circles and within just like public discourse on Twitter and social media and all this. Um, but I truly believe that like, you know, these issues of representation in popular media need to be dealt with by the people that are and the communities that are being represented. And that means, and at every level, like not just from, you know, the consultancy on a project um, you know, that has indigenous themes or, or, or Afro themes or, you know, Latinx themes, but all the way up through, you know, from that consultancy side to the developer side, um, produce production and also like executive level, like people in tech, the tech community in the gaming community are still from that like leadership, like rung of decision-making it's still pretty overwhelmingly, overwhelmingly white and overwhelmingly male. And that's just the fact. So I think only through, you know, diversifying those spaces intentionally because we have the capacity to be there, um, then that's when the change is gonna come. And I don't, I mean, I think I was just doing my thing when I was creating Terra Nova. I wasn't, I was, I was thinking critically about what I was doing, but I wasn't necessarily like wanting to put this in the hands of studios and saying like, do this do better, but it was more, you know, that personal journey of reflection and growth. Um, but I'm really glad it's being interpreted by, by people like yourselves, like that it could mean something more and be indicative of something more. And I mean, it is, it wasn't really motivated by money. And I think that's, that's something that needs to be called out to like games are like any other form of media. A lot of the decision-making is, is motivated by profit. Um, and I think that's really restrictive in our, capitalist world, unfortunately. Absolutely. I appreciate you taking time with that. I'm sorry. Now, Michaela, oh, did you have a follow-up? But I'm going to answer your question now. I have an answer for that. Um, I'm thinking about the first time that I, you know, saw myself as a Black woman, like, reflected in, in a video game. I really don't think that that really happened until 2011. Like, that was just, like, what, 10 years ago, right? And when you think about how, like, how old the gaming industry is and how old games is. So um, Dead Island, a zombie game, Perna Jackson. I believe she was the first time that I was able to play as a black woman in a game. Now, I think around that same time, you know, Resident Evil had released, um, y'all remember when they went to Africa and had the African zombies and Shiva was just like- Shiva Lamar. Was, yeah, yeah. I don't think we could play as her though. If I can recall, like I don't, I'm not, I'm not a fan of the Resident Evil like series. You know, I never really played it. Um, but I don't think you can. can you play her, Michaela? Interestingly, you can play it if you play the game in co-op. So if you have like the player two, you can play as a woman. That says says a lot about that. That if you wanted to play, yeah, very interesting. 
Okay. Well, um, well, e even it was so many problems with that. I just refused to play that one because it was just so problematic. But I, I feel like um, Perna Jackson, Dead Island was the first time I was able to play as a black woman. But they did the colorism thing in that game, right? So I remember like in the gameplay, um, Perna Jackson's a dark skinned black woman. But in some of like the um, the marketing and advertising materials, like they lightened her skin, you know. And so, uh, you know, so it's like it's like a win and then a miss, you know. It's like you know they they I guess they we can't we can't expect them to do everything perfect. Um, but you know they were just like reinforcing, you know, uh, you know European standards of beauty, you know, reinforcing especially like you know the problematic narrative of like colorism, especially in you know black and brown communities, which you know we 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 experience like a whole lot. So um, I think that was the first time, and I had I had fun. And I think that's what got me into like the zombie genre because I was never really into like zombies, but Dead Island got me into it. So yeah, I answered your question finally. I'm sorry, <laughs> that, that's perfect. Uh, and what about you, Mace? Yeah, for me, um, it's a little bit weirder. But um, when I first stepped into World of Warcraft and I was able to be a Tauren, which is this race of like cow human people. Um, and they, their society, the art direction of that, you know, playable race in this, in this, uh, IP from Blizzard has them like wearing buckskin and feathers and live in teepees and stuff. And it's very like, you know, Plains Native American aesthetic from like Westerns and stuff, which is super problematic. You know, um, it was never okay. It isn't okay. <laughs> Uh, but there was something weird within me as like a, a young 11, 12 year old gamer saying like, wow, like I feel like I can make a choice and I can make a choice to be an indigenous character. And that felt really good. Um, but yeah, it's not okay. It wasn't okay then. It's not okay now. It won't be okay moving forward. Um, I really wish they would do something with that because it's such a big IP. Um, I still play WoW to this day. It's kind of like what I'm really enjoying right now. Um, but you know, it, it's not great. So actually on a more positive note, um, the first time that I played a game where I felt like I played it as an indigenous character in a way that was, um, you know, as the developer was treated with a lot of care was never alone. Kasima and Ginchuna, which is this platformer cooperative, you know, I, I feel like I've referenced it in Terra Nova a little bit, but, um, you play as Nuna, who's this Anupiak girl um, from Alaska. And, you know, you're moving through this world um, that's like really, really beautiful in the Arctic. And you're trying to like save your community from this never ending blizzard that you don't know why it's there, but it's there. And um, you're doing so alongside your your best friend, who's a, a an Arctic fox. And it's just a really cute game, but it's also really culturally significant because it was done um, in consultation with the community. Um, so I would I recommend people go play that. It's like it so much writing and, and media and commentary has been done on that game. Um, but yeah, that was one that I was really, really excited about and kind of, you know, in, inspired me, springboarded me into doing the work that I was doing, um, you know, for the past several years. And on that note, I would love Michaela. Like, what, what about you? You know, you're you're kind of on the same you know, playing field as us in terms of your relationship with games and, and oh, yeah. critical theory. Um, so. The first time, I, I really love the Gears of War series. And I love uh, when I get to play with Anya because I wanted to play as a cool warrior, as a cool woman. But for me, it was problematic because it was, as you were saying, the, the representation of a blonde girl that doesn't really had to do anything with me. So the, the last installation of the game that when you have like another kind of character with a mixed heritage kind of represent me more. But coming back is Mass Effect is one of, as I was saying, one of my favorite games and had this kind of very cool ability to, that you can shape your character in any way you want it. So I could create a character that was not only physically related to myself, but also with my values and my emotions. That is something very interesting because games are, for me are ways and gateways for creating narratives of empathy that you can try different skins and you can feel things that maybe an experiment with things that maybe uh, you don't do in your real life or you are not uh, aware that you are in your real life. 
And so I value a lot these kind of rehearsal spaces that they allow us to, to try new things and to dream about to become things. Uh, I always say that I become in, uh, interested in re do research about the ethics of artificial intelligence while thinking about these alien races and these robot races and their struggles because they were machines, but they also were sentient and they were treated as, treated as slaves. So for me, games are a very powerful way to create these narratives and transmit a message. And this, this comes to something that I, I want to ask you if you have shared in your experiences and your research is that games has been overlooked as something that is minor, that is something not worthy of the study and research. And nowadays we have this kind of explosion of gaming that everyone in lockdown is playing games, everyone is connecting through games. And even the, the World Health Organization has to change its view about addiction because we have like these several layers on gaming that we can talk about because we have like this individual level on how games affect us, how to create community through games. Also the, the good and the bad about games, like the toxicity that they create. Also, we can create communities for good and we can found our peers through gaming, but also games enable a lot of uh, toxicity and violence against women. And also, I wish we could have Celia to, to talk about this, the dark patterns of addiction that are trying to be embedded into, into games. And um, what is your experience to kind of these layers of individual collective and also good and bad? That's a, it's a lot, a lot in one question, right? So I want to break down, you know, and I want to make sure that I think I understand like what you're asking. So I heard things about addiction. I heard things about, you know, gaming being like ignored, but now all of a sudden everybody's like a gamer, right? Um, I think that that's really like interesting, you know, the, the pandemic and COVID and like being in quarantine, I think it really highlighted, you know, um, and of course it reframed like a lot of our thinking around, you know, our consumption, like our, our entertainment consumption, right? Um, what we consider like leisure and what we consider like, you know, recreation. Um, but I, I feel like it also, I'm glad, like it dismantled like a lot of that stigma, you know, associated with like gaming, right? You know, because there's so much like even as, as, as academics, you know, y'all know, like, you know, we've got our colleagues asking us like, oh, you play video games? games oh that's child's play you know they have no idea about you know the anatomy of gaming and the architecture of like the spaces I'm like you know it's more complex than that right um and I think that that's why there's so little research because it's not enough of us like who actually play like doing like a lot of this work so I love like you know that we are um I, I love that moment I love corn uh, COVID probably only because of that because it really told the world that anybody can be a gamer and you should be gaming right now because you have nothing else to do like I love that narrative right but I also want to make sure that you know I saw of course like the other problematic narratives that were associated with that right of course we saw a lot of that moral panicky like language of course the addiction conversations were happening and of course conversations around like screen time and you know parents are like well we're cooped up all day well what's all the screen time going to do to my child what's all this doing and and you know luckily you know we've got like decades of research that you know can dismantle like disband all that but I don't know if that information was getting to the people who really needed it I think that's one of the 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 concerns that that I had, you know, when I saw like some of the popular articles like coming out, you know, from you know, like the Washington Post or whatever, or, you know, like New York Times, like, you know, I don't, I don't know that, I don't know that we're in control of our narratives enough, like within the gaming world, right? You know, and I don't know, like, you know, what I'm, I'm gonna say like, you know, games journalism, you know, they spend a lot of time like inward focusing and like internal, like looking and not really realizing that there's like this outward external conversation that we need to be in charge of and like we need to be controlling as well, you know, because right now it's still like, you know, the folks who are, you know, of the moral panic variety who are really like controlling like a lot of the narratives right now. And I think that's kind of like what you were getting at, like with like the addiction kind of conversation. Right. Um, but I think that, you know, um, whenever I had my gaming lab, you know, I spent a lot of time like um, with, um, you know, uh, guardians and uh, parents and elders, you know, of, of children to help them like understand, okay, this is what your child is doing in this game. You know, this is what they're doing when they're spending all of this amount of time there and getting them to like re frame that and to see you know I also hate to like reduce what we're doing like in games to like skills based conversations I'm like but they're developing this skill they're learning how to do that they can po possibly translate this into maybe something like a career or you know translate it into like you know a skill that they could take into like a computer science major or something you know but but I, we have to like finesse it like in those ways so people can 
understand and not not just think that their their kids are like you know, wasting their time when they're on Roblox all day, you know. And so I guess I wish we had like a lot more of that, you know, the people who are like the advocates and cheerleaders of like games that are having these public conversations, you know, because I hate that, you know, it's like the, you know, I don't I don't want to, you know, publicly like shame like people. But, you know, if we think about, you know, like like high profile people like like Ninja that like dominate like the conversation and then the, people get like a negative view and like it's like skewed negatively, you know, like, well, why would I want my girls in a space where, you know, people don't want to play with them because they're girls or why would they be in there because of all these toxic because all this toxic spaces and I can't send, you know, let my kids watch YouTube because of all the the, to the toxic algorithm that's going to feed them all this awful stuff. You know, I'm like, I'm like, yes, I get all that. But, you know, there's other things that's like happening. And I feel like that we spend so much of our time combating those kinds of narratives that I don't want to say it stops our building and it stops our growth. But I'm sitting here thinking about when I'm asked to give a talk and how much I have to like talk about racism and sexism, I'm like, okay, but there's so much more here than just that. But, you know, I know a lot of people are still just like at that conversation and I get it, but I guess, I, I guess I, I just wish we were further along, you know, when you think about like imagining like the future, I guess I just wish that we were having different kinds of conversations, um, but we're still kind of having like the same conversations. Yeah. Absolutely. Every time I, I gave a lecture or, or a talk, one of the things I start to dismantle this prejudice is like showing the other side of gaming. Because I don't know your views on, on this, but for me, it's like people tend to see video games as thinking like movies is all Marvel Studios and superhero movies. So they don't know that like this kind of independent side of gaming and all these beautiful narratives and beautiful games. So my first take on this is like showing two, three, four games like My Name is Sam, uh, um, like this word of mine, like games about being a migrant. I showed uh, parents about this game, That Dragon Cancer. The whole people have translated their suffering experience into a game because another prejudice against gaming is like games are created for fun. And one of the things that for me that we should kind of talk about is that games are ways to tell stories. And the story that you're going to tell is up to you. So a game can contain a sad story, a, a, a beautiful narrative, something uh, talking about the war from the perspective of a survivor or talking about the war from the perspective of someone that is losing a, a, a loved one to the war. But I think that one of the, the, the things that we have to aspire for as people working in the space of video games is that to deconstruct this narrative of games are for teenagers, just for fun and just about uh, menial things that are irrelevant and not and won't be useful and that you're wasting your time while you're playing games. Yeah, if I could just chime in here too, um, you know, I just want to thank you both for like all the work that you're doing with your communities and beyond, like sharing that word. I have definitely come like bumped up against that in my experience as well. Um, if I could just digress a little bit and talk about like what happened when I was wrapping up development on Terra Nova and I was like doing play testing. Um, I, I was at my my mom's house and I was like, hey, like, like we're gonna do a presentation like with your students on because she's a elementary school teacher. Um, you know, we're gonna do a presentation on this game with your students tomorrow. Like, don't you wanna test out the game and see how it is? And at this point, like she knew I was working on a game, but she didn't really know much about it. Um, and she's never really engaged with video games at all other than through me and you know forming her thoughts and opinions about how I've interacted with them you know from her perspective as a mother and then also you know hearing as you guys said like through the you know just external commentary through you know other sorts of sor sources of media that aren't necessarily like part of the gaming industry and you know we played this the game together you know we played this cooperative experience together and she she said like wow like thank you for sharing this I didn't know that games could be about anything other than killing other people with guns. And I was like, yeah, like this is, I didn't, I had no interest in creating a game where, you know, we were violent toward one another or, you know, we saw blood and gore just for, just for entertainment purposes. Like this is a game about a story that I wanted to tell and a story that I wanted to share with others because it's a story that I've been thinking about for a long time. Um, and I think it has something to contribute. So <laughs> I, 
I mean, maybe it's a little bit my fault of playing games like Call of Duty when I was growing up and and, and showing this the st stuff to her and introducing this stuff to her back then. But I really love how our, you know, our relationship kind of grew and our understanding of one another grew a little bit more through having that experience with this game that I was just creating because I was interested in creating it. And for me, also games, as you were saying, that it enabled this conversation with your mom. I'm seeing a lot of parents that are starting to starting to play games with their teenagers and they find in this kind of not looking into the eyes of the one another but playing by by side by side like this is space where they can have like very difficult conversations and in this kind of relaxed game so i i also value these kind of games because sometimes people take value uh, from fortnite of another this kind of social games uh, just thinking that our, I, I'm a day by daylight player and I play almost weekly with my friends and that's my space to talk about our week, to unwind, but also to construct our, our relationship. And I think that this is something that sometimes get lost in the narratives of video games, that people get isolated in games, that people play alone. And the reality is that we play together and that we construct things together and that's we can extract conversations from the, those games. I think that's a beautiful point, Michaela. And I think that that's where a lot of folks don't even realize, you know, the possibilities and potentials of what gaming can offer, right? You know, just that community building. And it's so interesting, you know, I'm just thinking about how equipped gamers were for quarantine, right? Like they were already ready to go. I'm like, hey, I got, I'm like, and even think about, I remember, um, you know, hearing some of my, um, um, like some of the parents that are part of like, you know, like school groups, um, and just hearing them, uh, talk about that their kids were missing out on so much social. Um, and I, I, I couldn't contribute to that conversation was like my children are not missing out on social because they have a social life like through games and I think that was like you know it was like one of those communities of like you know parents who are really restrictive over like screen time you know of course devaluing and diminishing like games and you know I was sitting in an iPad and stuff and they were not prepared for quarantine you know they were not prepared and their their kids weren't equipped you know to have you know to continue with like social relationships and and with community you know because they didn't allow their kids to like play games and like be in there and so i'm just thinking about how much like you know gamers um uh didn't like didn't struggle i mean there were other struggles like i'm not you know trying to dimin diminish it like in that way but i think that that's like a great point that that you made there um michaela um but i think that there's so much that folks can learn from the gaming space as well and take forward like i'm even thinking about how much like the gamers like um helped um like our gaming students help like the professors with like online classes of like hey you don't have to just use zoom and you don't have to just use this you know you can use twitch you know i'm just thinking about you know i remember doing like a workshop like to help like you know a lot of my colleagues think about like different modalities and different ways to like deliver information i'm like you don't have to just be stuck in blackboard you know there are like some cool things i'm just thinking about just how gamers were ready for quarantine we were really primed you know for that moment and you know we shined we shined a whole lot too <laughs> <laughs> totally. I, I totally agree with that because we were we had the lights, we had the streaming capabilities. And also it, it's amazing. Yeah, <laughs> that, that's right. I remember a few years ago uh, that I couldn't travel to a conference and I proposed to them like I do regular streamings. I, I teach on Twitch uh, how to play Magic the Gathering. That is another game that I'm passionate about. And I proposed to them like hey, we can do this. I can travel, but we can do this over Twitch and we can do this over YouTube. And that was a, a gaming conference. And that was kind of, we can do this. Uh, so for me, it's like super interesting to see how, uh, and this kind of uh, takes me to another area of research that are streamers, because now gamers were kind of consuming inter entertainment products, but now they have integrated themselves into the this kind of, creation uh, process and now they have become creators themselves and they are taking games and transforming games which for me as a digital and cultural artifact is amazing because I, I did a lot my background is in intellectual property law and I did a lot with these kind of restrictions that you have over how you do playing games and one of the amazing things about streaming is like if you want to stream a movie you are going to get 
uh, th that movie is going to get down, that stream is going to take uh, down immediately. But it didn't happen with games. And this kind of symbiosis between the publishers and the developers and the gamers that enabled this space to create over this kind of uh, their intellectual property without asking gamers to pay a license. And now gamers are like, we are entitled to do this with these games. And that created this kind of beautiful space when streamers and people play in sports for, for money and esports has flourished. And this is amazing because it separates video games from other creative industries. And we have these kind of uh, kids that are creating careers and they are doing kind of these creative outlets through streaming. And for me, this is something that my generation didn't have it. And, and, and for me, it's amazing. I wonder, I didn't know if Maze was gonna like respond to that, but there was something, uh, are we okay for time? Because there was something I wanted to like revisit and like ask Maze and ask you all's opinion. Okay, okay, great. Um, one of the things that I wonder, you know, Maze, as, as you were talking, you know, about you being in that space and like creating your game and also like playing, um, you know, the problematic narratives of, you know, black, indigenous, Latinx folks, Asian populations, you know, just how problematic those narratives like have been in games. I remember having like a conversation and thinking about like a different media, you know, we were talking about like film and, and TV and there's something that, that we call like the Tyler Perry effect of how, you know, there are problematic narratives that are out there, but because that's all we have, like we need to consume it and we have to consume it to prove to the industry that we are, uh, we have consumption um, power, um, that we will support that and that that in turn would lead to more diverse narratives. I never agreed with that because I'm like, if we are, if we accept like the stereotypical kinds of like practices, then they're going to always give us that because that's what's going to, you know, sell. That's what's going to make money. And when you go more complex, the audiences aren't ready to consume that. Does that make sense? Like what I'm saying? Um, do, do you all, do you all, what are your thoughts like on that of like, okay, just because we have that content and that we have to consume it. Um, Yes, because because we do it. I, I really thought about you know your 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 play with you know World of Warcraft um, maze it made me think about that. Yeah, this is kind of the uh, the question, right? Is like how do we push the narrative forward externally when you know we can also push the narrative forward internally within the spaces too. Um, I don't know if I have an answer for it. So maybe I'll just talk about how this has touched me and my research um, and stuff, which is like through my research and creating Terra Nova as part of, of my thesis in my master's, um, I also you know, was looking at indigenous video game development practices in general and kind of like that history. And what I was finding or what I found in like the work of, um, for example, Elizabeth LaPonce, who's uh, a Métis, um, Anishinaabe, and Irish uh, game developer and scholar, and as well as like the work of um, Aboriginal Territories in Cyberspace, which is a research lab at Concordia that I got to work with while I was doing my master's, is like Indigenous communities and Indigenous people will consume games and media and, you know, representations of themselves, but it um, ch amazing change really happens when the tools of production are really placed into the hands of those creators and they get to make, to be in power and make decisions about what enters into the things that they create. So, you know, I don't think we're ever gonna really get to a point where, you know, we're, we're seeing good cultural and diverse representations in games and other media until again, like what I was saying before, I was like, when we're in the in in the boardrooms, in the writing rooms, in the developers' chairs, even coding, you know, creating the game and the, the design from the code up, and you know, diverse experiences are even like factored into those decisions too. And again, like power is such a big part of that. For me, also, I agree that diversity is key to have each and every one of us representing all, all along the process of creation of video games. 
And if I can chime in with something about the industry, because my background I have, I did a bit of uh, video game journalism and I cover a conference as a C3. And one of the things I, I realized is like when a big company like Microsoft is acquired some other studios, they are acquired in these studios because of their originality. So for me, independent studios are, are the ones that's going to save the industry. The industry needs uh, these kind of refreshing and new stories. And they're going like to mix up because one, they have the resources to provide to the developers. And also the developers have like this creativity that sometimes they don't have like the, the economic possibilities to, to create. So this is a mix up where beautiful things can happen. And also I think that we are going to move into a space when everyone can be a creator because you have tools like dreams and you have like uh, tools that you can create a game without needing to be like a, a coder because another uh, prejudice about creating a game and being a developer is that you need to code. And may, there are a lot of roles that you can assume when producing a game. So I think that part of the job is like to make people realize that they can work in the game industry and they can enter the game industry and not necessarily be like a coder or an artist. Maybe you write beautiful stories so you can contribute from, from there. And also from the uh, video game industry standpoint is that you realize this, you, they are going to realize that they need this refreshing quality of originality from creators and, and the diverse backgrounds, with the diverse backgrounds. Yeah, I think that that makes plenty of sense. Thank you all like for engaging like with that conversation. And I know one of the things that I always try to try to tell folks, I'm like, OK, the stereotypical narrative is like, OK, sure. Like it's not that it's not true. It's that we don't have like enough alternative narratives so that audiences who don't know enough about our populations, you know, won't just believe that that's who we are all the time. Right. So I'm thinking about like, you know, like thinking about like GTA and showing like, you know, like struggle classes of like, you know, black and Latinx like folks or whatever. Um, uh, and I'm like, sure, yeah, we know drug dealers, you know, I got drug dealers like in my family, but we're more than that, you know, <laughs> like, you know, we have, you know, there are professors in my family, there are like, you know, people who, you know, working class folks like in my family, you know, so I guess I just, I don't, I, I wish that we could get away from like that limited narrative, right? Um, because we are, our populations and our communities are so much more than, than the stereotypes, yeah. We are like uh, almost 13 minutes. We have 13 minutes, but I, I didn't want to go without asking you about the future of video games. Because one of the things that I'm super interested in doing research about is the metaverse and this kind of new step, uh, this evolving step from internet that mixes uh, social media platforms and gaming and create this kind of virtual worlds united, but also like all in the same place, that's this kind of all encompassing space. And there are thought as really immersive space and places where people can have all the different aspects of their life, but recreated in a digital setup with all the problematic things about being living a, a digital life uh, that is privatized because you're going to play it and be in a private space. And what do you think about the future of video games and futurism video games is like, do you see a connection between these two topics? Maze, do you want to go? Because I can, I can jump on in there if you want. Okay, okay. Um, I think about this a lot because I think about Afrofuturism a lot, right? Um, but I think. Um, the industry as it's currently constructed is not prepared or equipped with the tools to be able to create um, diverse futures that really make sense for our populations, right? Um, because right now, sure, you know, DEI, okay, diversity, equity, and inclusion, okay, I feel like that that's like the um, that's that's like the easy way out, right? So it, we see now a lot of the industry they don't mind like making statements like stop Asian hate or Black Lives Matter, right? That's like, it's like part of their brands now, right? It's like, um, 
it's cool now, so they don't mind doing it, right? So I'm just thinking about, you know, all those companies, all those gaming companies that put out, like, you know, Black Lives Matter statements or put out, you know, um, language in support of, um, uh, you know, like the violence against, like, Asian um, populations. They haven't done much else, right? But that's part of, like, the DEI approach. That's a part of, like, you know, well, well, we'll just, create, you know, put these statements. We'll hire a few folks. We'll do this. But there's not real change, right? Some people say that that's incremental change. I disagree. I don't think that that's change at all. I think that they're just like placating, right? And they're just, you know, trying to like do things, you know, they're just putting band-aids on like wounds, right? Because, you know, there are a part of like these legacies and the vestiges of like, you know, racialized institutions and, you know, they're part of like, you know, the structure, you know, supporting and upholding like white supremacy. Um, and if like, you know, they can't like address those kinds of things, then, you know, the future's still going to be problematic. Like, you know, I really didn't think... Well, you know, I'm 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 just gonna say the statement, but I don't really but but I'm just thinking about the conversations that we're having now are conversations that we had ten years ago and what what I heard from other folks that they had ten years prior to that. Like so the conversations aren't evolving and aren't changing. You know, we're still thinking about, you know, how to get like women and girls into like STEM because of the leaky pipe in STEM. You know, why can't we keep them, right? Why can't why won't they stay? You know, but we're not thinking we're we're also individualizing, you know, a lot of these problems and saying, well, if we can, and it's also blaming the victim. Like, think about like how much pressure is like on the oppressed is like on us to have to do something about our oppression. Why do we have to be the ones educating folks? Why do we have to be the ones that to say, okay, well, you're messing up. Don't do that. That's a misstep. Don't like these folks are not, they're not, they're not dumb. You know, these folks are like some among like the most brilliant minds like in the world, but they can't figure out how to fix these problems. Like to me, that's like that's willful, right? That they want to be there. They have a continued investment or, you know, just like, you know, Professor Lipsitz might say this. They have this possessive investment in white masculinity and upholding and supporting those. So if we think about like the future, we haven't dismantled like the foundation that 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 grew that grew this, right? The roots are bad. You know, we think about like a tree, you know, we're trying to say, okay, well, the pretty leaves are going to come soon, but the pretty tree, you know, the pretty leaves are going to be from damaged roots. And to me, we have to uproot the whole tree and we have to start over and we have to start over like in a way that, um, that incorporates us from jump, that values us from jump. Now you see like different, like, you know, uh, different companies, you know, trying to like do this kind of stuff. But I think that if we don't have like a massive overhaul, we're just going to continue to see a lot of the same. I'm sorry. I wish that was like more hopeful. Uh, I'm sorry that that's like, but I, I just have to be real about what, what I see the future is like in this moment too. Absolutely. We are still paying the, the, the consequences of Gamergate and we're still seeing this kind of culture that is embedded into the gaming culture. And for me, uh, from Women in Games Argentina and the topics and the things we participate in, it's like we are trying to like educate on Twitter and trying to tell other people like, okay, having this uh, female character that is unattainable bikini is not inclusion. It's not like you have a woman character. It's, that is not representation. Having a woman character is not representation. So we are still fighting these battles. We're still hearing the same arguments that are uh, coming from the Gamergate. And for me, it's also problematic that this kind of narrative had expanded to politics. And we see some arguments that were held in Gamergate that were sustained with people, uh, followers in like the US presidential election campaign of Trump. And we see these kind of narratives replicated in the Twitch channels and the followers of these, these narratives. So for me, this is bad, but I, but I try to keep like this future of hope and that we can create spaces for, for new games and new narratives and like continue to make noise about this and can kind of continue to make people aware about the potential of, of games and of gamings. And I don't know if you, Mace, you want to chime in uh, to this, or I, I, if not, I, it's totally fine. I definitely want to chime in now, um, just after how you both um, were, were taking up the topic. I, I just like couldn't gather my thoughts because they all went in a billion different directions about you know virtual virtual worlds, metaverse moving forward, all of these like really 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 big questions that a lot of um, companies and individuals are going to be tackling over the next few years and beyond. Um, 
But I think I just want to echo what Kishana said kind of at the end there was like the roots are bad, you know, and this, this goes down to the very, you know, bottom of this whole process of what it means to operate within virtual spaces, like the ones and zeros, the binary, you know, black and white, yes, no, affirmative, you know, unaffirmative. <laughs> um, it's just too limiting. It's too, it's too um, prescriptive. I think we need an, a new dimension or two or three <laughs> for which we approach these um, concepts. So that's what I'll say. I mean, I'm really, I'm really um, interested to see how um, not only indigenous communities and cultures, you know, as diverse as we are, think about the universe and think about reality and think about virtual um, space in relation to reality. Um, because I think a lot of really fruitful discussions and alternatives to kind of how our mindset is kind of framed in this, um, you know, westernized hegemonic system. Um, but then also, you know, the voices of other diverse um, perspectives as well are super, super important, um, not just culturally, but, you know, thinking along gender lines and um, thinking along uh, like economic lines too. Like, I think that that's something that we haven't really talked about much either in this conversation is like the stratification that we're seeing around the world, you know, uh, of the ultra rich and the ultra poor um, is just getting further and further with less and less space in between. And I think games are pretty inaccessible still and something that I'm really passionate about making more um, you know, accessible in the future. So I'll kind of just leave it at that. Like when I when I think about them, I have a, I have trouble thinking about the metaverse because I I, I just hear metaverse. I think inaccessible. Uh, there are so many topics that I wanted to talk to you. We should need like five more hours because, as you were saying, we didn't enter into like the the economics of this and the accessibility to the consoles and the accessibility to PCs. I have heard in an interview, Kishana, that you were talking about how you uh, started studying console gaming because you didn't have access to a PC when you were growing up. And that's that's very limiting. I did, on, on my side, I didn't have access to a console when I, until I was like in my late 20s. And for me, this is also, we didn't rise to the point of sustainability and the impact that is having on the planet, this massive consumption of electricity going around in creating this uh, and sustaining these gaming environments. We are almost at, three minutes time to, to end this talk, which, which I wish did it, didn't end because it's fascinating to talk to both of you. And I, I would love to end with like a quick question. It's like, Mace, I know that you have already created a game, but what will be your next project? And Kishona, if you are going to create a game, what, what game uh, would be and how that it would look like? I'll go first. Um, I, there's nothing in the works right now, unfortunately. I actually recently started um, a position at Unity Technologies, which is the big, you know, game engine. Um, a couple months back, and I've been really like pouring all of my heart and soul into joining the industry and seeing how like the other world works outside of academia. Um, that was kind of a goal of mine when I wrapped up my master's. Um, was to just like see what the industry was like and get that firsthand experience, and it's been it's been great with Unity so far. So nothing super creative in the works at the moment, unfortunately. But I am super you know passionate about having these conversations with folks like you, um, just chatting, talking, connecting, building um, you know a network of people having these types of conversations. And also just like I see my role now that I've kind of been there and done that and created a game, um, supporting other up and comers as well. I think I'm super passionate about like, there's a whole indigenous video game developer community that um, is just, is just, you know, growing right now. And it's really cool to see all the work that's, that's coming out of that, those folks. And yeah, I just, I want nothing more than to support them and, and make sure that they're creating awesome stuff and they have the tools and the ability um, to do that. So that's kind of it for me at this point. Um, but I would love to, to make, to make more stuff. Um, in the near future. Um, that was beautiful, Maze. Um, I think I'm I'm not about creating content and producing things just for the sake of doing it, just because I can, right? Um, and so I do it because I might see some voids or see some gaps or see some areas for improvement or areas for development. But I think, you know, 
gaming is in good hands if like you know if we follow the recommendations that you know Michaela made of like really focusing on like you know the indie scene the independent scene of seeing all the amazing stuff so now I can see myself I can see narratives of from like diverse perspectives so you know I, I think that was you know if you would have asked me this maybe like 15 years ago it would have been like a different answer I would have been like I want to make a game that does a b c and d right but I've seen that Terra Nova you know so many other like examples that you know so I I'm not, I'm not compelled to do that but I'm gonna just echo what Maze just said I would love to just continue to connect folks to like the important um to different to industry to access to like to get resources to get opportunities um so I think that's what I would that's what I see myself like doing right now yeah this has been an amazing conversation and I'm so grateful uh the possibility to chat with the two of you uh so Maze and Kishana thank you so much for joining us today for this fireside chat and I hope that we can continue this conversation in future conference and future uh, forums and to get more and more academics into the video game spaces thank you so much thank you thank you for hosting <laughs>